see. Probably, are you guys seeing the correct screen or the the notes? The notes, okay. Let's see, how do I? You still seeing the notes? Uh, just uh, double click your full screen though, move your screen, screen double click Let's try that. There you go. Okay, we're good. Cool. Yeah, that's okay. Um, all right. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, <clears throat> my name is uh. Luke Sheneman, I'm the Director of Research Computing and Data Services here at the University of Idaho. We're part of a, the Institute for Interdisciplinary Data Sciences. Um, and I do a lot of research myself in machine learning and especially computer vision um, and starting to delve a little bit more into language models. And so um, uh, last semester, I gave a series of three tech talks like this on how to do machine learning in Python. Um, we covered sort of the basics of using scikit-learn to do really basic stuff um, like random forests and, and stuff like that. During that um, workshop, we made a little um, handwriting recognition system that could recognize numerals from the MNIST data set. Um, then we moved on to doing stuff with generative adversarial networks and to be able to generate images using GANs um, in PyTorch, and then moved on to... Um, doing image segmentation for remote sensing data. So now we're going to be talking about something a little different, which is diffusion models, which combine both visual uh, uh, computer vision models and um, text and language models together into one sort of uh, cohesive model. Um, let's see if I can advance my slide. Yeah, OK. So. Um, so generative artificial intelligence, right, has gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, you know, just in the last year, it's really exploded. Uh, that's certainly true um, with chat GPT, all the stuff that Google and, and Microsoft and Anthropic and others, OpenAI, are doing with, with large language models. Um, and right before that sort of all exploded, you know, everybody was talking about these um, uh, diffusion models. And so these were the models that are able to take a text prompt and generate some image, right? Um, something that's never been seen before uh, based on just how you're prompting it. And that was really interesting. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, we still see a lot of stuff in the news if you have been following this recently about what's going on in the generative AI world, especially with open AI. Um, and they're doing a lot of exciting stuff. And I'll be talking a bit about some of the models that they they use um, here uh, in this presentation. But um, let's see. Come on, there you go. Okay, so generative AI really in a nutshell does this, right? It learns what we call a latent representation of a distribution from complex training data and then allows us to sample from that distribution. So we learn sort of the complex relationships and features and how those features are related in a very large data set. Um, and then once we have that model, once we have that sort of latent representation, we can then sample from that distribution to create something new, um, something that maybe combines a lot of the features that it learned in a new and unique ways. And so what we're going to be doing today is actually we're going to be generating faces, human faces from a training set. Um, and so what the training data that you'll see here are um, similar to what's described on this slide, a bunch of 64 pixel by 64 pixel by three channel, red, green, blue images. And um, we're gonna ingest those, learn about their features, create a latent representation and then sample from that. So that's what we're gonna do today. Um, and so, you know, diffusion models, like the really top notch diffusion models like Midjourney, um, Dolly, um, Stable Diffusion, you know, they can do amazing things, right? They can create, even though they were trained on images that they they scraped from the internet or other places, um, the the way they represent those in inside the model um, allows them to combine those features and, and styles in new and unique ways, creating really um, create I won't say creative, but it's kind of creative looking images, right? Um, and diffusion works in a in a actually a kind of a relatively straightforward process. 
Um, it takes an, when you're training a diffusion model, what you do is you start with uh, an image and later we'll talk about how you start with both an image and its caption. But right now, just to, just to do a diffusion model for images, you start with an image and you gradually add noise to it. You add Gaussian noise. So Gaussian is like, you know, sort of like a mean, you know, a, a normal distribution, right? You add Gaussian noise to that image in an incremental way. And you do it over a number of time steps, quite a lot of time steps, actually. So the really high-end diffusion models will iterate over a thousand time steps to go from the original image to what is pure noise, right? You eventually get to a state of absolute pure noise where there's no signal anymore. That's called the forward diffusion process. And then uh, what you do is you train a neural network. In this case, we use a thing called a UNet, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. You train this UNet network to learn to denoise the image. So it learns as you, as you corrupt the image, it learns how to uncorrupt the image. Um, and so, uh, and that's great. You, you learn all these things, uh, you know, ab about how to denoise uh, as you go along. And then, uh, so then when you go to sample from your distribution, what you do is you generate a purely random picture. Just a bunch of random pixels have no signal in them whatsoever. And you denoise it in a stepwise fashion until you end up with something that you've never seen before. Pretty cool. Um, so uh, so I mentioned conditioning. And so what I, what I mean by conditioning is you can control that reverse diffusion process with things like text prompts. So if you provide a text prompt um, in natural language, like uh, this little, this little uh, AI generated character here was from Mid Journey and the text prompt was a mini golden doodle in a space marine armor, right? And so it produced pretty much what you asked for, kind of a stylized version of it. but. Um, but that's what you got, right? And what happened was it started with nothing, it started with absolute noise. And every iterative step of the way, as it was denoising that perfectly noisy image, it conditioned itself to uh, create an image that was in alignment with the text prompt that you provided. And we'll talk about how that how that works and how that happens and how you model language and images together. Um, so you can do really creative things. You can combine concepts, right? You can say like, this is this person is half Yoda and half Gandalf, right? And starting from absolute pure random noise in a stepwise way, using what are called embeddings from your prompts, you kind of guide the process until you get what you want in that stepwise way. We're, stable diffusion is one of the large... Um, diffusion models that are available. It's open source. You can download it and run it right now on your laptop if you want to, right? It might be slow unless you have a big GPU, but it, it'll work. Um, and it's it's all open source. The code is open source and it's open weights, meaning that they they you can download the weights, which are the actual trained parameters of the model and, and run this on your own computer. This is the general architecture of stable diffusion. Um, and so what they do, and, and the way I wrote my diffusion model that we're gonna go over is a little bit different, but fundamentally they start out with pixel space. So this is your picture. You basically encode your picture through a set of convolutional layers, and we'll talk about that, into what we call latent space, which is sort of this compressed representation of the features in your, in your image. Then in, inside of stable diffusion, you do this forward diffusion process and then the reverse diffusion process. Um, and again, you use the UNet, which is this, this shape right here, and you're conditioned with what they call an embedding layer or a semantic map, which takes your prompts and again, guides that UNet. And we'll be, our, my implementation is very similar to this. Um, except I do more things in pixel space rather than than latent space, but um, I think there might be advantages to doing it latent space, and that's why they chose to do it. But makes it a little bit harder to explain and more complicated. Um, but anyway, that's that's the overall process: forward diffusion, learn to denoise, and then condition on the denoising process against your your text prompt. Um, okay, so I'm going to do this a really quick like I'm going to back up and talk a little bit more about fundamentals because I don't know where everybody is as far as deep learning and what you know. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about stuff that we covered in the first three tech talks that I gave, which were machine learning basics, neural networks, what is a tensor, what is a convolutional neural network, why are GPUs important and why are we using PyTorch? 
Okay, so just basics, right? Machine learning is a data-driven method for creating models for prediction, optimization, classification, generation, and, and other things. Um, there's all sorts of things out there uh, in the Python world for machine learning. Python has become more or less the default predominant language used for um, for deep learning. You can do that other things in other languages like R, but but if you really want to get serious, and especially if you're doing stuff with computer vision, Python is, is where you need to be. Um, there's libraries like scikit-learn, PyTorch, TensorFlow. Those are kind of the main frameworks. There are other frameworks as well, but those are kind of the layers that you use in order to, to do your, your machine learning. Um, and, and so, uh, what you can do and that what you what I show you in, in this little example, and, and this is something I covered in the first tech talk, is to use this really simple data set, which is a bunch of 28 by 28 grayscale images of handwritten digits, right? Which creates this data set called MNIST. And that's kind of like the hello world, the kind of the toy data set that everybody uses when they're learning computer vision. Um, because it's labeled too, right? So you have, you know, you have the the images, which are these are tiny little 28 by 28 grayscale images, but along with them, you have what the actual labeled value is of that. And so you can learn to do handwriting recognition or, or, or all sorts of things. But fundamentally, you take your data and your labels, you train a network to then make a prediction. So in our case, we were trying to create something that could recognize hand, handwritten digits. We trained a neural network that can then output with different probabilities, which, which, um, uh, uh, which uh, digit you wrote, and then you can pick from that probability and, and that's your answer. And so um, that's kind of the basics. And so inside of neural networks, right, you typically have sort of your initial input layer and output layer and some number of hidden layers. What I'm showing here is what they call a fully connected network. Sometimes it's called a um, multi-level perceptron, but it's basically you have a bunch of neurons, you have connections between those neurons, and they're they're organized in layers where you have your input layer, output layer, and some hidden layers in between. And what you try to do is modify these weights that are associated with the connections between the neurons. So those are your learnable parameters, right? Or your weights that you're trying to optimize. You also have something called bias, which is just another learnable learnable parameter at the neuron itself that is something that you can you can learn too. Um, and so as you're speeding it data and trying to optimize the network, all you're really doing is turning little dials on all of those parameters. And there can be millions or billions of parameters. Um, some of these large language models now have hundreds of billions of these tunable parameters, right? So imagine the computational complexity in trying to optimize that, right? We're not gonna do anything at that level, but um, but that, that's sort of the gist, right? And this is, again, sort of intro to neural networks. You'll hear me talk a lot about tensors and a tensor is really simple. Um, you know, there's that there's that Python package called TensorFlow, and uh, you know, and that's exactly what it does. It controls the flow of these tensors, and a tensor is just a data type that represents usually a, an array. Um, it can represent a scalar if it's rank zero, which is just a single value. It could represent a vector, which is a a, a linear list of values. Uh, a matrix, which is a 2D tensor, is rank two, and a 3D tensor, you go up to 4D, 5D, 100D, whatever. Um, tensors can be arbitrary as far as the number of dimensions that they, they have. But that's like the fundamental data type that all of the neural network um, packages work with, are these tensors. Um, and so, like again, a fully connected neural network, um, what you would do with that, with this MNIST data set, would you take your, your 28 by 28 image, you'd linearize that, you know, turn it into a vector essentially, and that becomes your input layer, 28, uh, uh, well, I guess there's four, 784 once you linearize it, um, pixels in that 28 by 28 uh, image, and those become your inputs to your, your fully connected network. And on your output side, you would have 10, 10 neurons, each one representing one of the 10 numeric digits. Um, and then you train that network and you'd, it's pretty easy to develop with this system, uh, a system that can recognize hand, you know, handwritten digits. Um, okay, but that's great. But what we really wanna do uh, next, sorry, uh, is be able to take images um, and extract features at different levels, right? And that's, that's part of what you do in these fully connected networks in the hidden layers is those sort of represent um, sort of higher order uh, 
features about the image. Um, and so what you're, you're kind of trying to do is take your input images, condense it into a smaller number of internal nodes in your, in your hidden layer that have to encode the same stuff, but sort of in a, at a different scale. And so you start doing things like identifying edges or dark spots or light spots. Those become features that your hidden layers now pick up on. And after a while, as you go through your network, you're not talking about pixels anymore. You're talking about edges and bright spots and shapes. And you're not explicitly talking about those things. Your network learned itself that those were important and needs to pay attention to those. Um, but that's what happens. Um, and so you go from those things to mid-level features. Like if we're talking about human faces, you have eyes and ears and noses. Those become features that your neural network like starts working with all the way up to like facial structures and things like that. Um, what you really, but you really want to do with images though, is not linearize them like this because you lose a lot of the spatial information. You, you know, everything becomes one big vector. You don't know if a pixel is adjacent to another pixel necessarily, right? It's just one big line of, of values. And so what you do instead is you use these 2d filters. And so what you're doing here is applying, uh, this filter, um, which is just this three by three matrix that uh, uh, that I'm kind of highlighting here, um, and you apply that in a sliding window approach over your input, and do some matrix multiplication and uh, uh, dot, dot products really. Um, and when you do that, what ends up happening is you detect edges. This matrix on the left detects as, detects edges as horizontally and the matrix on the right when you apply it in the sliding window fashion detects vertical edges. So, okay, here's a set of filters that detect edges. Um, but what we wanna do is use what we call a convolutional neural network, which is where you take these filters and you apply one filter for uh, to, to uh, uh, an image uh, to extract what they call a feature uh, layer. And, and you can apply any number of these filters to an image and extract deep feature layers. Okay, so this is called a feature. This the, in this particular iteration here, this is called a feature map. I can specify the number of channels I want or the number of filters that I want to apply, and it will do that through what they call a convolutional process. Um, and then typically, what you do is you shrink down your spatial dimensions, your x y spatial dimensions of your image and extend your feature map more deeply. So you're essentially compressing the spatial representation of your image, but you're extracting those edges and eyes and nose and whatever uh, in a more deep way and then working with those. So can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. So can you actually quickly say a little more about convolution? So in the animation you had of like top left that had a very mm -hmm. systematic way, is the idea of convolution that there's some other kind of a systematic pattern or can you say something about that? I mean, that's typically what you do on, on modern hardware like GPUs. It can do it like all in parallel, right? To do to do these computations um, really quickly. Uh, but but yeah, that sliding window approach is typically what you do. And and you specify usually a stride, like you can you can actually like skip cells. And when you do that, you end up shrinking your dimensions of your image and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's really very much a sliding window approach. And I th think it's usually kind of like you read a book is typically the, the order in which those get, get happen happen unless you do them in parallel um but yeah the uh the thing is though that when you're training like a convolutional neural network um the filters you don't specifically say i want this sobel filter for edge detection you don't specify that the neural network learns which filters it wants to apply. It basically learns to fill in these values in these with what are called kernels. And those are your trainable weights in a convolutional neural network. You're basically learning which filters do I need to apply to which tensors in order to extract the features that are most important for me. And you don't specify that explicitly as a programmer at all. The computer learns what's important and makes, you know, to, to optimize the network. Um, and that's the whole process. And so you go through this stepwise approach and we'll be using a convolutional neural, neural network for this diffusion model in a, in a minute, this one called a UNet model. Um, but that's exactly what it does. So it goes all the way down to, you know, started out with a 28 by 28 image and it went finally down to a four by four image, but with a really deep feature map. At four by four, there's not a lot of visual anything left, right? But you have this deep set of features. And then from that, you can then pass that on to a fully connected network where the final layer of that fully connected network is uh, 
uh, your your digits that you want to you want to select from. Um, and so that's how you transition from a convolutional neural network to a, a set of values that you know, for example, for classification, which is what this is. Um, okay, so so yeah, I brought up GPUs. So GPUs are really important, right? Because for machine learning, because most of the operations you do are these these matrix multiplications, dot products, matrix addition, things like that. And GPUs, just based on the way their architecture is, they've got hundreds, if not thousands or tens of thousands of individual cores that can each do these operations in parallel. And so that convolutional process, while you can do it on a normal computer, um, it's got to do it sort of in serial with that sliding window approach, and it takes forever. But with, with uh, GPUs, you can do these um, matrix multiplications very, very quickly. And so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about GPUs. And in the code that I show you, we'll use GPUs to, to do the, the diffusion model. Um, uh, the Using the GPUs is pretty easy because PyTorch and TensorFlow and those, those um, frameworks know how to just work with your entire technology stack and make that happen. So this, it's really, really simple to use. Okay, so diffusion models. Um, <clears throat> so the, the the top there is actually an animation of a diffusion model that starts with pure noise and renders flowers. Um, I saw another a similar one that does the same thing for butterflies. Um, those flowers may or may not actually be real, represent real flowers uh, that might you might see in nature, or they might be kind of um, you know unique things. Um, but kind of kind of a cool image. So again, the, when you get started with forward diffusion, one of the first things you need to do is define how many time steps you're going to use to, to add noise and then reverse. Um, I'm going to use 100 in my model just because that was seemed reasonable. Um, but it's common to use e even thousands of steps. Like I mentioned, I think open diffusion or stable diffusion uses one or 2,000 steps, right? So there's a tiny little steps where you're adding just a little bit more noise at every at every phase and that lets you have a lot more granularity sort of temporally as you as you um as you're trying to denoise that it gets a little easier for the model to learn how to denoise a little bit at a time rather than a lot um you can imagine that it would be really hard to go from pure noise back to like your original image that's like almost impossible. So you have to do it in these stepwise ways and the more steps that you have sort of the easier that is for the model maybe to follow along. So you have to establish how many time steps and then what's your noise schedule. And there's two sort of main noise schedules that are used. That's kind of the rate at which you apply within those time steps, the rate at which you apply the noise. Uh, linear, you know, you just add the same number of, you know, same gradient of stable diffusion or sorry, of uh, Gaussian noise to your uh, your image as you go. Uh, that's pretty common. Uh, the other one is to use cosine where it kind of starts out more slowly. Um, and then, and then kind of picks up a little bit and then kind of goes, goes more slowly again at the end. And, and so that, that's actually what I use um, for this example. Um, you, there's other schedules that you can use. And I think there's probably an art and a science to picking a schedule that works really well for, for you. I'm not exactly sure what like stable diffusion uses or any of the others, um, but cosine seemed to work for me. Okay, so one of the things that is really important and is what they call time step encoding. And so what you're doing here essentially is you're saying you're, you're providing a hint to the neural network. You're saying, I'm going to give you a noisy image, but I'm going to, I'm going to cheat and give you a hint as to what time step we're in. And that, that's a big hint that the, the neural network can use to, to properly denoise at that level that it needs to, right? So it, it can incorporate that information, that time step encoding when it goes to, to denoise the image. Um, and so, so what I do, uh, the way I approach it, and there's different ways to do this, but um, I did this all again in pixel space where I just created a, a um, two-dimensional matrix, the size of the image. And for every pixel value, I just put an integer for what the time step is, okay? So um, every pixel value in this, I work with 64 by 64 um, images. So every one of these 64 by 64 pixels has the number 30 in it, right? And then I basically uh, add that, I concatenate that to my image. So now instead of having a three channel image of red, green, and blue, I have red, green, and blue and time step. 
And that's the tensor that I give to my UNet network. Okay. Um, there are other ways to do this that are maybe more clever and, and uh, better, uh, but, but this seems to work okay. Okay, so now we get to our convolutional neural network. And I'm going to show you in code how this is defined and, and how this all works. But the idea behind the UNet is that you send it, again, in our case, a four-channel image that has that time step encoding as input. Um, you can kind of ignore this. I just grabbed this from the original paper on the unit so that the, the resolutions of the images and stuff aren't exactly what we're using. We start out with a 64 by 64 picture. Here it says uh, 572 by 572, but we're 64 by 64. We have our, our four channel image. Then we run a couple of convolutional layers. We apply 64 filters to the first one and 64 filters to the next. So you see that 64 number up here. So that, that basically ends a couple of convolutional steps ends with some sort of feature extraction with 64 filters applied and then 64 filters applied to the filtered images. Okay. And then you do what's you do this, this, what they call max pooling, which is you're basically shrinking your, your tensor now at that level, uh, spatially in half, right. Both width and height. So, um, from, for us, we go from 64 by 64 to 32 by 32. And then we extract a deeper feature map. We apply 128 filters now to that downsampled um, uh, set of um, uh, that downsampled tensor. Um, and so that we extract 128 and then 128. We repeat this process until we get to the bottom. Okay. And at the bottom, um, for us, I think it's like a four by four. Uh, um, since we started out with 64 by 64, I think we end up with a four by four spatial image and this feature map that that's a thousand uh, layers deep. Okay. So it's all features at that point. There's no spatial, anything left at that point. Um, and then we begin to upsample again. So this is the U shape, right? Then we, we go, we went down. And so what we're doing here is this is called the contracting section, or you're basically doing a form of compression. You're kind of compressing your data into this feature rich, but spatially small thing down here at the bottleneck, okay, which is this area here. And now you have your, your expanding component, which is you go back up to your original picture size um, with the features. So you're feeding your features up. And then the cool thing about the UNet is it uses these residual, what called residual connections or skip connections, which is you take the spatially explicit data that you had in the encoder portion and you bring it across and concatenate it with your tensor that you had had from your future feature your deep feature extraction so you're kind of getting the boast of best boast of best the best <laughs> of both worlds uh which is to say uh you're you're combining the spatial information that you have at the encoding level which is more spatially explicit with the deep features that you've you've extracted below uh from from going all the way through the bottleneck and back up and you do that at every step and so at the top step you're bringing in spatial information that you extracted when the image was still a, its original 64 by 64, but you're combining it with features that you learned through your traversal of the whole unit. And you're combining those together. It's up to the unit to decide, you know, it's up to the network as you optimize it to decide what's important and what's not, right? But it may decide that that skip connection is super important because I need to grab this spatial information here and combine it with this feature that I see here. We see that they're in the same location in space. And so that's important and et cetera, et cetera. So that's how a unit works. It's a super powerful convolutional architecture that's used in all sorts of things. Um, and we use it here for our denoiser. Um, okay, so again, we for training our neural network, we add Gaussian noise with each time step. And then... Um, we have to compute uh, loss as we uh, learn to denoise our image as we as we we do that. And there's a couple of ways you can compute loss for these diffusion networks. And you know, one is to do mean squared error, which is just to con basically to compare your prediction of taking the noisy image and denoising it. Right, you denoise the image. You compare that in one case to the original perfect image, right, at every step. That's one way of com computing loss. Um, there's, you can also do it in a more stepwise fashion where you denoise an image at one step with the intent to denoise it up to the level of the prior step, right? So you're doing it sort of uh, 
in a in a stepwise fashion. And that's what you see with this second loss, uh, the second loss function. And again, that's that's mean squared error. Um, or or you could treat the unit basically as a loss predictor. So you're just trying to use the unit to find um sorry, a noise predictor. So you're using the unit to determine, to predict how much noise uh, is at this stage. And then you can use that to subtract that noise from uh, from the prior time step. And so those are all different ways you, you can approach it. Um, again, I'll go through this in code in a minute, but you know, I ran this for a hundred epochs, which means I took my training data and I ran it through the network a hundred times, all, all of my training data a hundred times as I iteratively optimized it. Um, every time I did that, I randomized it. So I shuffled the data. So it was presented to the neural network in a different order. Um, I, I used, again, time steps of 100. So I was adding Gaussian noise at that level. Um, with GPUs, you can, you can use what are called batches, right? And so you can process batches of these images in parallel. I actually processed... This, these are tiny little 64 by 64 images. I processed um, 1,250 of them at a times in parallel uh, on a GPU that had, I think, 24 gigs of video RAM. That's about how much it would fit on that. Um, and that makes it a huge speed up, right? To do these things in batches rather than individually. And that's that's why it's almost impossible to do this on a, on a computer without a GPU. Um, I used the atom optimizer, which is really common with the learning rate. That's that's pretty common. These are all parameters that you can play with and tweak and and and, and, and that sort of thing. But the core training loop is pretty simple. I determine my schedule from the cosine schedule. Give it, give, give that the number of time steps. It returns this list basically of what variance I need to apply at each step. Then for every epoch, for every batch, and for every time step in sort of that nested for loops. I would add Gaussian noise based on my schedule. I would use my neural network to predict, uh, you know, either a denoised image or predict the noise. I would compute my loss function, which is really important because what you're trying to do in your neural network is optimize your loss. You're trying to drive your loss to zero or, or as low as you can. Um, and then you do the normal process, and I'm not going to get into it, but a backward propagation and optimization, which is where you are tweaking, you're tuning your dials, right? Based on based on um, your loss that you you calculated. Um, so I used for this project um, what they call the celeb A data set, which is a bunch of celebrity faces with attributes. So th there's over 200,000 uh, face images of various celebrities. Uh, there's, and there's over 10,000 unique people. Um, and the names of the celebrities aren't given, but with that comes this really rich annotation of, for example, um, I think there's 40 different attributes that are binary. They either have it or they don't. Do they have glasses? Do they have a beard? Are they male? Are, you know, are they um, old? Are they fat, <laughs> all sorts of different attributes here that are in the celebrity data set. And that, that's that's really, really uh, useful for what we're going to be doing next with this. And in the, in the celeb data set, there's two different versions of that data set. There's sort of in the wild, which is like the celebrity sort of is a smaller part of a larger picture, sort of outdoors or wherever. Um, or there's kind of a cropped, cropped and aligned, right? Which means that their faces are sort of cropped to the same general shape and size and with their eyes kind of in the, in the center, right? So it's all kind of cropped and aligned. I use the cropped and aligned version of this data set for what I'm doing, just because I think it was easier to learn. Um, and this was my preliminary output, right? So uh, this is what I was able to sort of, sort of learn, right? So this is sampling from the distribution that I learned from my celebrity data set, right? Um, for some reason, they all seem female. Um, uh, this one turned out really wonky. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened with that one, but um, overall, you know, it did okay uh, for the size of data. Well, in fact, let me show you the next slide. Um, well, yeah, let me talk about this real quick. So what these, uh, models do like stable diffusion especially you know is deal with everything at that 64 by 64 sort of postage stamp size and they emit that and then they use a different ai model to upsample it 
to get up to the 512 by 512 output that's pretty typical. You can go higher, you can go to 1024 by 1024 or whatever. But, um, uh, and so here is actually, you know, my little postage stamp celebrity amalgamation um, using another AI model to upsample it. And so that's that's pretty typical. So, you know, it's a human face. It learned a human face-ish. Um, and again, it might not be terrific, but again, I only trained on 5,000 images for a couple of hours on a commodity GPU, whereas Stable Diffusion was trained on 600 million images, which took 256 top-level GPUs, over 150,000 uh, GPU hours, and it cost them about $600,000 to train, right? But you can see, you know, it paid off. This this bottom one is a Stable Diffusion, you know, fake person, and this is my fake person. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, maybe a little bit more effort, we can get it better. But um, but anyway, super super fun. And I think you know some tweaking with time steps, with number of epochs, with um, my loss function. We can I can probably nail it. So within a twenty four hour period or whatever, I could get some pretty good pretty good photos. I think um, not really my day job though. So. Um, so again, I wanted to talk again about the UNet architecture because now we're going to be talking about okay, what I did here was. What I did here was I didn't provide any prompt, right? I basically just fed it a uh, totally random 64 by 64 by three uh, set of values. And it responded with a face, right? Um, there's no prompt. I didn't condition it at all. It's just pulling stuff from the ether to, to produce faces. Um, but now we're gonna talk about conditioning. So how do you combine language models and the concept of language with images to constrain your your um, your your diffusion process. So again, this is stable diffusion, and what they do is they have this entire conditioning sort of chunk of what they what they have, which is they have a um, semantic map of um, what various uh, tokens mean. Right, a token is basically a, a word. So what those what those words mean in the kind of context of the English language or whatever language you're using, um, those those things are called embeddings, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But but those embeddings represent like a deep understanding of that word in the context of the English language, and when you put them together in a prompt, it can put them together in a way that it kind of gets the gist of what kind of image you need to you need to produce and then guides the reverse diffusion process to produce that. Um, so when we talked about how I uh, pre-process the celebrity data set in order to uh, enable the sort of prompt stuff. So first of all, even though the celebrity data set only had, you know, had like, I don't know, 200,000 images or whatever of celebrities with captions and annotations, um, I just used the first 5,000. I didn't have the time to let it run for a month, right? So I just used the first 5,000 images. And what I did um, was read the annotations file. And the annotations file is really just a, you could read it into a spreadsheet. It's really simple. Um, I, I read it into a, a pandas data frame in Python, um, uh, which is trivial. And then um, for each of the images, you know, every row is an image and its attributes. Uh, I got the um, the heading name, which sort of describes, okay, beard, hat, male, whatever. Um, I grabbed that, that word, I normalized it a little bit, and then converted it into a prompt, right? So I converted it into a prompt that looked like, in this particular case, a photo of a person with bushy eyebrows, a beard, mouth slightly open, wearing a hat. So those are attributes. I just pulled them out and turned it into a something that resembles a natural language text prompt. Uh Okay, so I have that. Then I crop the largest square from the image. The images that I got weren't square and my algorithm needs a square image, right? So uh, I cropped the largest square I could find uh, out of the image and then resized that square now to 64 by 64 by red, green, blue. Um, and then I use this thing called Clip. So Clip is a model from OpenAI that is open source, open weights, um, super easy to use. I'll talk about it in a second, but I can use that Clip model to, uh, to find the image embeddings, which is again, the semantic, what is in this picture in a semantic way and what is in the prompt in a semantic way. 
and I'm, I'm able to get uh, I'm able to get those uh, embeddings from the prompt that I created here and the image. Um, and then uh, I create this big list of four tuples, right? Where I have the file name, the image as a, as a NumPy array, uh, the image embedding, which is just a, a vector of numbers, um, and then the prompt embedding, which is the same. Those image embeddings and, and prompt embeddings are 512 in length, and they're just floating point numbers. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. Then I pickle that. So in Python, you can pickle a data structure, which just like, clumps it together and then you can you can save it to disk and so I can load that pickle file again later. And I did this because I didn't want to have to, as I'm training, I didn't want to read from the file system. I wanted to pickle this, load it into memory and then just train from memory because it's so much faster, right? Than than to use disk. Um so let me talk about this clip model because it's one of the coolest things I've ever seen. So uh, and nobody's heard of it, right? So uh it's this contrastive language image pre-training model. Um, again, it's open source, multimodal, and it's truly multimodal, which is to say it has a shared semantic embedding space for images and text. Um, they used a transformer model, the one specifically that was used in GPT-2, to create the token embeddings for text. And then they used a transformer model, a vision transformer, to create token embeddings from images. And they made sure that and their input data was pairs of images and text, right? And they made sure that as they were creating their, training their model to with their embeddings to make sure that those embeddings were in alignment, that they matched up, that they were either the same or very similar in, in this sort of embedding space. Yeah, Harpo. Do you know whether you can the synthesis of the text transform text or part I think they let both of them go at the same time, which is not necessarily how I would do it. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, I think they, they did it slightly differently than I, than I probably would. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll move on. But um, so what you can do with Clip, and these are some examples, right? You can give it a, you basically, you can provide it a picture. You get the embeddings from that that picture. And then you can provide it like some list of possible descriptions and it will tell you what's the most probable uh description that matches your picture so in this one it said okay well this is this is a photo of guacamole okay and it's that's actually like pretty pretty sure it is and i think it's right um it's able to see that this is a you know given a list of of cars like a 2012 honda accord coupe or honda accord sedan or uh, acura or whatever it was able to accurately say hey this you know, of the list of choices that you gave me, I really think that this is a, a 2012 Honda Accord uh, uh, coupe. Um, you know, it, it can tell the difference, uh, you know, I'm not sure, you know, how accurate it is, but, you know, it's pretty sure that this this tissue sample here represents some, some, some issues. Um, it knows that this is, you know, given the choice between line dancing or square dancing or other things, it says, oh, this is definitely line dancing, right? So it... And the thing is you can interrogate all sorts of aspects of these photos, right? So I was doing this with a, a picture of a of a puppy um, just as a test, right? I was like, okay, is this, you know, I gave it three options. I said, um, in fact, let me show you the code. This is how you, this is how easy it is to work with clip, right? It's this, this much code. Um, you basically import clip, uh, get your CUDA stuff set up, load up your model. Um, VIT stands for vision transformer. Um, and then you pre-process your image so that it's ready to send to clip and you tokenize your text, which means you turn your, your text into um, numeric values that are called tokens that the AI can, can deal with. Um, and then all you do is you say, encode my image and return to me my embedding vector. Encode my text, return my embedding vector. Um, and then and then what you, uh, so that the, the uh, the text that I provided was, okay, a diagram, a dog, or a cat. What What is this thing in this picture that I'm uploading? And it will spit out um, basically a list of probabilities that are in the order of your labels. So is this a diagram or uh, uh, a dog or, or a cat? And I uh, this I, this wasn't my example, but I think what this was was a, was a diagram. And so uh, basically, it's able to tell you of the list of options you give it what, what you're seeing here. So I did this for a, a picture of a puppy, and I said, okay, is this puppy cute or menacing? Oh, it's it's definitely cute. Okay, is it 
laying down or is it standing up? It's standing up. Is this a black lab or a golden retriever? Black lab. How is it young or old? You know, and you're, you're able to ask all sorts of, you could play 20 questions with it and probably get a pretty good uh, idea of all sorts of things about the image to be enough to probably generate uh, a, a meaningful caption for that image. And in fact, there are systems that use clip to take an image and generate a textual uh, um, caption for that image. Um, so super cool. And, and, and we use it. It's, it's also one of the, the neat things about clip also is it's, it does zero shot classifications. So it has, it, it, it understands how to take an image, pay attention to what's important, map that to that semantic vector embedding space in a way that it, it can tell you, it can reason, well, it can, it can do similarity searches for things it's never seen before. So it may never have been trained, for example, on a particular thing, but it, it's able to extract enough features and understand its, its semantic, uh, understand uh, semantic representation enough to make sort of analogies. And, uh, you know, so it, one example, I, I, I was playing with was, okay, um, is this tiger lying down or, or not? Right. Cause I was working with tiger, tiger images. And I don't know if it was ever trained on that or not, but, um, but it knew what lying down was. It knows what a tiger is and it can put those two things together and tell you, you know, what this is. Um, it's been used for all sorts of things, right. Um, conditioning generative AI. So, so clip is used for Dolly for, for guiding the, the, um, uh, refu reverse diffusion process as I use it. Um, uh, it's useful for generating captions, like I mentioned, image similarity search. So Google's um, image search, when you when you search for images that are similar in Google, it uses something very similar to Clip to do that. Um, it can be used for content moderation. Like for example, is this obscene? <laughs> is this image obscene or is this pornography or whatever it is, right? It can it can identify that pretty accurately, even even if, if it wasn't trained on that specific kind of scene or whatever, it knows. Um, so it's it's actually pretty cool. And we've even used it for object tracking. Is this is this image in this frame similar to the image in the frame previously based on where it lands in, in sort of embedding space? Um, okay, so uh, a little bit more about that embedding. And this kind of leads towards my talk next week where I'm gonna talk about large language models. I'm gonna talk a lot about embedding and embedding layers and, and, and that sort of thing, because that's really an important part of transformer models. But um, but again, what you do is you take your object, whether it's a, a text prompt or a picture, you run it through your embedding model and what you get out of it is a vector, right? And it's a vector of, um, you know, in, in Clip's case, 512 dimensions. Uh, GPT-3, by the way, the DaVinci uh, version had 12,888 dimensions to their vectors. So again, those vectors are what encode the semantic uh, sort of meaning or representation of the, the photo or prompt. Um, and then be, it's really useful. You could think of it like coordinates in like a highly dimensional space, right? And 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 that's one way to think of it, but really it's even better to think of them as really vectors, right? Where you've got amplitude and direction because then you can actually use things like cosine similarity to, to measure the distance between vectors to, independent of their amplitude. And so uh, when you do that, you can, you can do things like see that a puppy and dog are pretty closely semantically similar, but very different from house, right? Um, you know, King and queen are, uh, you know, maybe more closely related than man and woman, I guess. That's that's kind of what they've, they've done here in this example. Um, these semantic vector embeddings, again, are learned from large, you know, data sets. And based on, you know, kind of multidimensional, multi-scale co-occurrence of those objects or of those tokens or whatever in, in your training data. Um, so CLIP was trained on 400 million image text pairs. Um, and again, it took 256 large GPU servers two weeks to, to build Clip. And now it's free for you to use and easy to use. So, um, but you can do those kind of sem semantic similarity searches. And that's kind of what underlies how, how Clip Clip works. Um, and so this is this is how I, is getting to Arpon's question, his, his like, how, do, how does Clip actually make sure that the embeddings between the images and the and the prompts line up? This is how I would approach it. And I've read a little bit about how other people have done this too. 
which is you take you take your your image, um, you run it through a convolutional encoder to get a sort of latent representation of that, um, and uh, and then take that uh, that output, linearize it, and then in your final layer, make sure that that of your fully connected network, make sure that that's the same as your embedding vector length, your vector embedding length. And then, uh, but before you do that, you you uh, use a transformer to learn the vector embeddings for the text so that you you understand, you know, what, what the vector embeddings for those are. And then you fix those. Those are now fixed. And then you optimize this part of it so that they always try to line up, right? You're trying to optimize the output here of your picture to line up with your, your caption. And you're, you're, what you're doing is you're controlling the, the weights in your fully connected network and your convolutional network to get to that point where your images will now be in full alignment in vectors, uh, in embedding space with your, your prompts. And so that's, that's kind of the way I would approach it from scratch. Um, Clip handles it a little bit differently where they kind of do both uh, kind of independently. Um, and I'm not quite sure exactly, you can read the, they have a paper out, you can, you can read on exactly how they do it, but they, um, they use transformers for both of them. And then they do do a process that clip stands for contrastive uh, language uh, something. Anyway, it's, it's, it's the way of um, trying to make sure that those things kind of align and they do it in a, in a slightly different way. Um, <clears throat> okay. So now, okay. So now we want to take our, uh, prompts that we give. So, you know, I generated faces now with the training data that I gave it, right. I should be able to say, okay, I want a picture of a woman with glasses who's bald, right. I should be able to say that. And it should be able to generate that by conditioning the reverse diffusion process based on my prompt. And the way I would do that, first of all, is to make sure that the denoising algorithm knows the vector embeddings for my, uh, prompt. Okay. Um, so how do I, how do I tell the unit about that? Well, my vector embeddings are through clip are 512 in length. And I happen to have a 512, uh, deep feature layer towards the bottom, towards the bottleneck here in my unit. So what I'll simply do is take the values from my clip embeddings, um, my, that vector, and I will essentially add that numerically add that to the feature map. And so what you're doing is you're basically like injecting the signal from the clip uh, prompt embeddings into the convolutional neural network so that it is aware now of kind of what, what it is you're supposed to target. Okay, so that's part of it. Um, but now you need a new loss function, right? So you need to be able to now optimize your neural network um, so that you pay attention as you're denoising uh, to what the image is supposed to be, right? So you you penalize images that don't match your prompt, basically. Um, and remember, in you know, in, in the, your prompt and your um, uh, if you're using clip, your prompt and your image should be more or less in agreement or really similar to each other. And so if uh, so, what I would what I what I would recommend, and this is what I'm I'm doing. I haven't yet implemented this. I'm hoping by next week, if you guys come back, I could show you what this looks like when it's implemented, but this is how I'm approaching it, right? Is I'm gonna compute the loss as kind of a weighted linear combination of sim, you know, mean squared error. So trying to match the target image, but conditioned on the cosine similarity of the two embedding vectors of the, you get the embedding vectors of the image as you're denoising. And you make sure that that is as close as possible to the embedding vector of your prompt. And you do that at every stage in the in the denoising process, um, and if you do that, then 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 I think you're good. Okay, so uh, so code. I think we're almost out of time, unfortunately, but um, I do have the code up at this GitHub uh, repo, GitHub.com/slash/shenaman. It's just my last name/slash diffusion. Um, I uh, will bring it up just real quick. Um, Let's see. At least I will try to. Okay. I think you guys can see that. Um, I am almost certainly in the wrong spot here. So, 
this the way, get out of the way. Okay, so bear with me just one sec. And I know you probably have to go soon, but um, I just want to show you what this the code kind of looks like. So I'm logging right now into our high performance computing systems at RCDS, which is the unit that I, I uh, help direct. Uh, we have, by the way, um, a lot of GPU nodes that are available. So if you, you know, some of them with a lot of memory. Um, and so if you want to train your own models um, and you don't have an account on our systems, please come see me um, or send me an email or follow up somehow. Um, our website is hpc.uidaho.edu and you can request an account um, and then get access to those GPUs for, for this kind of stuff. Um, uh, okay, so if you look at, um, if you look at that, uh, um, GitHub repo. You'll see. You'll see this code here. Um, the. I'm gonna. Is it? Oh, it's not showing up. Okay. Wonder. Okay, I'm sharing it, but I'm not sharing it up there. Okay, that's weird. Mm. Let me get out of this. Okay, um, I think that's it. So just really quick, I just wanted to kind of show you what the what this looks like. Uh, I should have had this up earlier. Okay, uh, yeah. So um, really quickly, I'm just kind of gonna go through this. There's only like three files that are really important and then and then I'll call it good here. But this, there's a unet.py file, which defines that unit architecture. And this uses the PyTorch um, sort of functional uh, um, sort of description of, of how to build a uh, an architecture. I developed these convolutional blocks, which are these two dimensional convolutions um, with some batch normalization and an activation function. Um, the encoder blocks are the ones that sort of descend in the unit, right? Those are the ones that, are, that descend. Um, those are the encoder blocks. The decoder blocks are the ones on the right side of the unit. And the important part with those is that they connect then with through that, that skip connection to, or, or residual connection back to the other side of the network. Um, and so this is our definition for our, our neural network architecture. Um, and the unit itself, you know, it's got these encoder encoding layers that, that get uh, progressively more filters as they go down. Um, they go down to the sort of the center or the, the, um, uh, the, the, um, what's the name of it, uh, bottleneck, and then they go back up and then um, and then they make that connection. So this is pretty easy to follow once you kind of look at it for like 10 minutes, you'll, you'll understand exactly how this, this is put together. Um, and this, this is pretty, this is a really boilerplate uh, unit, right? So if you Google this, you'll, you'll find examples of how other people have done this. You can act, you can just ask chat GPT, it'll, it'll spit out this code. Um, uh, and lately it'll, run it too, which is crazy. But um, there's also the um, the celeb A data set thing. So this is how I pre-process those images and annotations and run clip to get the embeddings. That's all in here, um, you know, and then ultimately spit those out as a pickle file. That's where you get those. And then, and then all the magic really happens in, um, come on. In this diffusion.py file, right? So this is this is where we actually do the training of the model, and, and we load up our data set. We, you know, make sure that our CUDA, which our GPU is is is, is set up right. We've got functions to add add noise to the images, um, and that sort of thing. the The main training loop is is right here. Again, we iterate over all epochs, batches, and time steps. 
um, adding noise as we go and then learning how to learning how to denoise it um, as we go as well. And then the final thing, uh, there is a uh, an inference.py. So this is a this is a, a script that you would call if you wanted to load a trained pre-trained model and then generate an image or 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 whatever. You, you can just call this inference. Um, so with that, yeah, go ahead and check check out the GitHub. Send me an email if if you have any questions. Um, happy to take questions here, but I know we're, we're also uh, over time. Thanks. Okay, I guess new questions. All right, thanks everybody in, in Zoom land.